Criminal Law, Chapter 6. Somebody asked me if this is going to be interesting. That is up to you, all right? I think so. So I gave you some learning objectives. I'm not going to go over those. That's just for your handout. It's always good to kind of look at, in the beginning, what should I know at the end, all right? And then when you get going to the study for the test, you might go back over these questions and say, do I know the answers to those questions just in general, all right? So the first thing I want to look at are some key differences between civil law and criminal law. Now, for those of you who took Law 1 already, you are familiar with the civil law column, and so this is a contrast to something that you already know. For those of you starting Law 2, both columns are a blank slate, and uh, this is all new to you, okay? So you have to learn it all at the same time. But the purpose in kind of going over a chart like this is to explain and kind of highlight some of the uniquenesses of the criminal law process. Now, this is a chapter that combines, uh, I, I told you that we do in most chapters about a semester's worth of law school combined into two class periods, okay? So it's a very high level kind of an overview. This is probably more like three semesters of law school because you have both criminal law and criminal procedure, and those are usually three, <coughs> three semesters, so a year and a half in two days. All right, so ready? Go. All right, so this is, uh, a lot of this has to do with the criminal procedure side, okay, and admittedly, uh, most of the stuff that we're going to look at actually does have to do with procedure, but then we're also going to look at the criminal law side and look at what is a crime and, and what are some different kinds of crimes and things like that, all right, so that would be the more interesting part, I promise. Okay, so what are some differences between the criminal law and the civil law. The first difference we look at is who brings the thing into court, all right? So I'm using generic terms because it's called different stuff in, the, in both sides. It's not a, a suit, a lawsuit in the criminal context. It is an indictment. It's not a, uh, a complaint. It's a, an information or, or an indictment. So there's different terminology that's used. But somebody's got to get the thing started, right? So in a civil lawsuit, that is one person suing another person, the one who brings the suit is a private citizen, and he's called the plaintiff, right? So if you've ever seen the People's Court or any one of the other gazillion you know, judge shows out there these days, uh, none of which are as good as Judge Wapner. I mean, he was awesome. Uh, but uh, And Rusty the bailiff, you know, he was cool. But... The first person to come in is the plaintiff, right? They're the one that files the lawsuit. Now, it's different in criminal law. It is not a private citizen that brings the case into court. It is a prosecutor, a prosecuting attorney. Stated more broadly, it is the government, the state, or the United States of America. So when you are charged with a crime, it is not Matt Davis versus you as a private attorney and as a citizen, it is the United States of America versus you, all right? So a little bit of an imbalance there. That's why we go through all these constitutional protections. That's why we need that. There's a huge imbalance of power. You notice we're kind of on an equal playing field over here. The plaintiff hires their lawyer with their own money. The defendant hires their lawyer with their own money. But in the criminal process, we have the vast, unlimited, print your own money in the back resources of the United States government coming to a point against you. Yikes. Now, that is true in some cases. The reality of the system is that budgeting and other kinds of things tend to limit the resources, those vast unlimited resources, don't all get given to, uh, you know, Jefferson County, Wisconsin, okay? So there obviously are some practical limits to that. But the theoretical, it's unlimited, and it certainly is unbalanced. They have a huge police force to investigate, and they have a whole cadre of attorneys in the, st in the prosecutor's office and investigators and all of those resources, and you have a public defender or your your own privately hired attorney and whatever resources they have. It becomes very expensive to defend yourself in criminal court. So, first big difference is it's the government that brings the case, not a private citizen. All right? 
Second thing, the wrongful act. In civil court, it is considered that you did something to hurt that person. You harmed them. You breached a contract. It was a civil uh, tort. You, your car smashed into theirs. And so you did harm to an individual somehow the individual that's suing you, as a matter of fact, and that is the playing field. That's the injury that has occurred, the wrongful act. In the criminal law system, you might have hurt another person, but it's not considered to be a violent crime or, a, or a, an offense against that person. It is considered to be an offense against the people, all the people. And so the government takes that up on behalf of all the people, okay? It's not considered to be a violation against the state. Get that, get that distinction. It's against all the people. So in a state case, you'll oftentimes see people versus Matt Davis. You don't, well, actually, you don't often see that in particular, but hopefully. But you would see people as the... Why just generic people? Well, in a lot of states, they choose to do it that way. And what they're trying to convey is that when you did this wrong thing to that one victim that you had, when you stuck up that quick trip or whatever you did that was a crime, uh, you did that against all of us. So it wasn't just your one victim that was harmed. It was everybody, the people. So you violated a statute in some specific kind of way that is laid out and spelled out in statute, and for that, the people are coming back and, and uh, bringing these charges against you. All right, number next, burden of proof. I guess first I need to explain what is a burden of proof. Well, a, a legal burden of proof means that the person who brought the lawsuit has the burden, has the responsibility to prove the case. And then you say, well, that begs the question, prove it to what extent? In other words, do I have to prove that it was more likely than not that it happened? So you say, well, is that a percentage thing? Okay, that would be like a 50 plus point one, or just a little bit over half. Is that how sure we have to be? Is that my burden? Well, there's a name for that. Okay, that's called a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, and so if there is one smidgen over 50% surety that that's what happened in the jury's mind, then the plaintiff in a civil suit has carried the day. They've won. Now, that would never fly in a criminal case because in a criminal case, we don't just have to get to 50%. We have to get to what? Beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, way up here over on the other side of the scale. So the first thing they tell you in criminal procedure is when you're studying burdens, you cannot attach percentages to them. And, and in fact, to do so in argument would be, would be to uh, create a mistrial and probably get yourself thrown in contempt of court. <laughs> All right, So you don't say percentages when you're trying to instruct a jury. So they tell you that very clearly first thing in, in criminal procedure. The second thing they tell you is Here's some percentages, <laughs> okay? So they, they give you a framework to, uh, to think about it, all right? So if you're thinking about a preponderance as 50 plus something, all right, just over half, where do we stick beyond a reasonable doubt? Now, there are some in between, right? Clear and convincing would be, we'll call that 70, 75% sure, okay? But where do we peg beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, is it 100? You know, there have been plenty of defense lawyers that have tried to toe that line in their closing arguments. Unless you are completely sure, mistrial, <laughs> okay? Unless, jury, you are fully convinced, mistrial, all right? Why? Because they're insinuating that the burden, the standard of the state, is to prove it 100%, and that's not the standard. The standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, you know that by these two words, it must not be 100%, right? Because there is a little bit of wiggle room. And that is, does it say beyond all doubt? I mean, they could have said that, and that would have meant 100% sure. But the problem is, even if you had a videotape of the incident happening, 
And the Pope and seven bishops were standing on the corner watching it and testified in court that that's what happened. There would still be some knucklehead on the jury that would say, I don't know, you know, I've never trusted Catholics, you know, I mean, or whatever. And so you, you would definitely have somebody that would hold out. It, it would n never result in conviction. So there is a little sliver of open door, less than 100%. In fact, I would say it's somewhere around 95%, okay? And so that's what we kind of look at in the scale. So we say we never say that to a jury. I'd never say you have to be 95% because then everybody obsesses about these numbers and how on earth do you actually put a number on how sure you are that something happened. And so the point is that it needs to be beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, if I have a reason to doubt, then they haven't carried the burden. If I'm really still not convinced that this is truly what happened, then the state has not carried its burden. Who has the burden of proof? The burden of proof belongs to the one that brings the lawsuit. And another way to say it is the party that is attempting to change the status quo. All right. What is the status quo? Well, first of all, what does that term mean? It means the way things are right now. Okay. So if I'm trying to change the way things are right now, then I'm the one that has the burden of proof. And I say it that way because there are some cases where that flips, and the defense is actually carries a, a particular kind of burden. So in a, in a lawsuit, the party that's trying to change the status quo carries a burden of proof. All right? And what is the status quo in a criminal case? The defendant is walking around a free person. We're trying to change that, right, and put them in jail. So we, since the state, the people are trying to change the status quo, we have the burden, the burden of proof, is beyond a reasonable doubt. The verdict. What kind of verdict do we have to get? In other words, how many jurors do we have to convince? Well, in a civil case, you almost always have a three-fourths majority. So those two or three knuckleheads on a 12-man jury that just cannot agree, psh, don't worry about it, <laughs> okay? Call it to a vote and let's go have lunch, all right? Uh, you don't have to get a, a unanimous decision. In a criminal case, one juror holding out can hang the jury, okay? That does not literally, that's just a figure of speech, okay? Uh, a hung jury comes back, and they all, they're not allowed to tell you who it was, but they usually stare at him, <laughs> okay? Well, judge, most of us were fine with the verdict, but there was one <laughs> that we got, couldn't agree, and the guy's usually like, what, what? Uh, and so uh, that's how that ends up happening. So that becomes a mistrial, we try over again, we retry. So that's what happened in the Blagojevich case. Uh, remember uh, Governor of Illinois, I'm from Illinois, you know, Evan, we're proud of our state. In our state, uh, our governors make our license plates, you know, and it's uh, our former governors anyway. Uh, and uh, we have two of them imprisoned right now. Uh, and uh, two out of, three out of the last four, actually, we did some good, good amount of federal time. <laughs> so, but Blagojevich uh, is, uh, and, you know, I'd like to see the current one, you know. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, it's Rahm Emanuel. No, wait, wait, not the current one. He's the mayor of Chicago. That's right. Okay. Well, I guess the current one, he can stay for a while until we find out what he did. Uh, but in any event, the uh, what was I talking about? Uh, no one knows. What did I say? What is it? Hung jury. hung jury, right. In the first Blagojevich car trial, thank you, uh, it was a hung jury on several of the accounts. He was found guilty of some lesser counts, and the jury couldn't make up their mind. They couldn't come to a unanimous verdict. And so does that mean that he can't be tried again on those counts? Actually, no. It means that they get to take another swipe at it. They decided to do that. If Blagojevich would have just shut up, <laughs> he would have been fine. Probably wouldn't have happened. But because of his big mouth and going on The Apprentice and doing everything else, uh, he um, got retried, and it didn't go nearly so well for him the second time around. All right? Okay, and then remedies. Remedies. What remedies are available in civil law? Well, it would certainly not be nice uh, if uh, we got in a car accident, somebody you know, rear ends your car, and it was a nice car, and now it's ruined. And so you say, look, I want you to do time for this. And so I'm suing you, and I'm going to ask the judge to give you, you know, 10 years in prison for smashing into the back of my car. Now, could he, could, could people end up doing time as a result of a car accident? Well, certainly, especially if they were intoxicated or 
uh, intentionally reckless about some, some way that they were driving. So that's certainly possible, but that case is a separate case. That case is brought by the government and under the criminal statutes. The case you're bringing privately is only going to be able to give you money damages or an equitable remedy. What is an equitable remedy? That's like the injunction that we talked about in the last chapter, ordering them to do something, give, hey, give that back, you stole it, things like that. And then under criminal law, we can do a lot of things. We can fine them, so we can make them pay money. We can put them in jail, obviously. And ultimately, in most states, we can still even put them to death. Okay? So a little bit higher of stakes on the criminal side. Okay? All right, any questions about some of these differences before we move on? All right, let's move on then. So you can have, thus you can have civil and criminal liability for the same thing, right? So let's say that a person suddenly attacks Joe as he is walking down the street, right? And here's Joe, he's just walking down the street, and someone jumps out of the bushes and says, Rah! and just punches him in the face. How rude, right? I saw a funny one. It went the other way. Uh, you know, you, you see on these, uh, the, on, on the Internet, they have these uh, videos. I don't know if you know that. They, you guys, most of them you can't access, but uh, it's on a thing called the YouTube. You, you don't get that, the YouTube on uh, campus here. But um, the, uh, the, the, the guy's playing a practical joke, and he's hiding in a trash can next to a vending machine. And the, somebody comes up to buy a Coke, and he pops up out of the thing. Lid Are comes off, and he's got a scary mask on. No. And, he goes, and the guy, just without thinking, you know, just levels him. I mean, the trash can goes flying. The guy goes flying. I say, you got what you asked for, right? I mean, so he jumps out of the trash can. Please, paste him in the face. I mean, that's your civic duty, all right? Uh, we'll look at in a minute all the defenses that you will have in a situation like that, okay? Uh, and, and, but here's Joe. He's not doing anything. He's minding his own business. He's walking down the street, and he is attacked by someone. Well, that physical attack is a tort. Now, for some of you, a tort is a new word in the legal context. It is not a delicious uh, strawberry croissant. It is a... Uh, uh, it is actually a personal injury, okay? So a, a car accident type case where you have physically hurt someone is called a tort claim, all right? And so we studied that last, <laughs> last semester. Uh, a physical attack, though, there is such a thing as a tort for physical assault. And so uh, that you could certainly get sued for that. But a physical attack is also a crime. So which one? Do we have to choose? Are we going to sue him civilly, or do we want to put press charges to have him uh, put in jail? Well, maybe we don't have to choose, all right? We can do both at the same time. So the assailant commits what's called an assault. It's a specific kind of tort. It's an intentional, unexcused, uh, unwanted touching that either creates a reasonable fear of immediate harmful conduct. Uh, so when he says, ha, he, he scared the person, he made them think that he might hit them. And so in the tort side, remember, an assault is to create the imminent fear that this person is about to hit me. You know, you, you think it's funny in the dorm sometimes, you know, get, ah, you flinched, you know. Well, that's an assault. That's a tort. He can sue you if he thinks you're really going to hit him. Some of you probably learned that last semester. Anybody tried it yet? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm suing you, dude. Uh, don't do that. That's not the Christian thing to do. Then if he actually follows through, as the facts say, that he is actually hit, then we, not also, we also have, an, we have the assault, but now we also have a battery, okay? So in the civil context, an assault and battery is, first of all, the fear that you're going to hit me, and then the battery is the actually, you actually hit me. Uh, and so those, both of those things have occurred in his civil suit. He can file a civil suit against his attacker, and the court can order the attacker to pay him damages for his hospital bills and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and, you know, his life, rest of his life, he's emotional basket case because of this attack. And so you'll pay dearly. All right. Now, what about on the crime side? Well, he has also violated a criminal statute, and that is the crime of assault. Oops, here's one of those cases where we use the same word for different things. Okay. What is an assault on the tort side? Is it the actual hitting of someone? Or no, it is the 
creating the fear that you might do it or that you're about to do it. That's an assault on the tort side. On the crime side, an assault is the actual, like you would normally think of an assault, the actual hitting, okay? And so on the crime side, he's cre created the, ass the assault and the battery, and therefore uh, the state will prosecute him and order him to be either fined and or imprisoned, okay? So same act can be prosecuted for the crime and sued for the tort, yes? It's not the that's my point is it's really not the same thing. It, and and it, it kind of depends on the state statute. I've looked at Wisconsin on this. They actually define the assault as the hit. And it, oftentimes in the crime, it'll be a connected thing, assault and battery. Okay? Battery is Usually not. Now, in the textbook, I noticed they kind of separated them out, but I think that's actually not the way most states do it. They would just put them together. Yeah, Jerry. He can, right? Oh, good. I'm glad you asked. And we'll look at double jeopardy in just a little bit. But the difference is that double jeopardy says, and we'll look at this uh, probably, probably on Tuesday, but double jeopardy says you cannot be tried for the same crime by the same sovereign twice, okay, unless it was a mistrial. <laughs> a lot of exceptions, okay? So it, it only applies to being tried for a crime twice, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with a civil case. And the most famous case of this was the O.J. Simpson situation, where he was tried for the criminal case and acquitted, but then the, uh, the Brown family sued him, and they actually won. How, though, this is an interesting question that comes out of this, and it goes back to those burdens of proof, okay? So if you had a case, let's say that it was just, just this neat, okay? Of course it's not. Let's say this is our gauge of, of how sure. All right? And let's say beyond a reasonable doubt is over here. That we'll call that 95%. And this is uh, the POE, the preponderance of the evidence is right at 50 plus percent. So what if you had a case that fell here on the scale, all right? What do we do with that case? Is he going to be convicted? No, because no, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. So in the OJ case, we had, it wasn't quite too beyond a reasonable doubt, at least according to that jury, <laughs> all right? But in a civil suit, do we have to get over here? No, we only have to get here. Are we going to win that one? Yes. So for the same facts, in the same case, we could satisfy and win the civil suit and lose the criminal suit. And the fact that we lost the criminal suit first does not mean that we will lose the civil suit because we could argue that it's one of those in-betweeners. Different burdens, different standards. What if, we, what if we lost, this is where it gets more interesting, what if we lost the civil suit, a civil jury said it was not enough beyond a preponderance of the evidence, and then they wanted to bring criminal charges? <coughs> That'd be a higher hill to climb, wouldn't it? What would you need before you would feel comfortable bringing that criminal case? More evidence, <laughs> okay? More evidence to show something different because, you know, it's kind of like that's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over expecting a different result, okay? Well, if you didn't win when you only had to prove it 50%, why on earth do you think you're going to win when you got to prove it 95 all right? Okay, any other questions about that? Very good questions. All right, let's move on. So criminal liability, we'll just review here, is a person's wrongful act that can make him liable in both tort or criminal actions. Most every crime has a civil counterpart, no doubt about it, especially you start getting into embezzlement and the types of business crimes that we look at, larceny, burglary, embezzlement, insider trading, you know, all these kinds of crimes are also carry with them civil liability. Remember too, you're the, let's say you're the victim. K 
Can you demand that the state prosecute someone for a crime? Well, you can stand on a soapbox and demand all you want, but you are not going to be able to legally force them to do it. And if they say, look, and I've had plenty of churches. So somebody said, do you have a lot of experience, you know, personally defending criminal defendants? No, I don't. But I do have a lot of experience being the attorney for the victim <laughs> and trying to work with the system to make it right. Had a church in uh, Georgia that had a, a, an insider uh, embezzle over a million dollars over a six-year time span, over a million dollars. Come to find out they weren't paying their missionaries uh, for two years, and the treasurer was falsifying records, and you know, insinu- so the deacons thought that di- all the missionaries were being paid. And only when a missionary came back on deputation and talked to the pastor about how time, how tough times must be, and you know, it must be really bad for them to, even without any sort of a letter or notice, just quit sending him support two years ago. And you know, and he was being very nice about it, but kind of like, hey, man, what's the deal? Yeah. Uh, and the pastor was like, what are you talking about? Times are great. You know, offerings are up. We're having no problem. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you better check on that. <laughs> Come to find out, none of the missionaries have been paid for two years. And this guy was taking all that money for himself, over a million dollars. And uh, so we took the case. We had a forensic accountant come in and hired him privately to go through and, and bottle up all the evidence, put a bow on it, and dropped it on the prosecutor's lap and said, do your job, <laughs> all right? Go prosecute this guy. You know what their response is? We're really busy. And, you know, we've kind of prioritized the drug cases and the violent crime cases and this white collar stuff is really, you know, it's hard to win, and uh, you know, it's always messy, and we just don't have the time. What? You know, come on, you know, look. If you want to sue him, you can sue him, but we're not going to take the time to prosecute him. What? What can I do? Well, I can go to the media, I guess, and try to bring some political pressure. I can go to his boss. I can, you know, try to get a legislator involved or something like that. But ultimately. You cannot force a prosecutor to prosecute a crime. Matter of fact, there have been cases where the prosecutor knows full well that somebody did something wrong, and it's almost like you feel, what, are you personally involved in this or something? Why on earth would you not prosecute this? And they've sued them for that, tried to force them to do that, and the courts all over have said, prosecutors have broad discretion not to file cases or to file. What, what they're going to file, that is broadly, the courts will not intrude on that unless there is corruption. So certainly then federal prosecutors get involved in investigating state prosecutors. Those are the most fun, you know, and it happens most in the South, okay? <laughs> you know, it should happen more in Illinois, but it happens mostly in the South, and they will investigate federal ones that come in and do corruption. You know, you can see that little small town, you know, kind of Dukes of Hazard situation, <laughs> and here comes a federal prosecutor in and finds out that they've been paid off or something about this is a little bit off. And so certainly that they would. But for the most part, if a prosecutor decides not to take the case forward, there's nothing you can do about it. But you can certainly go and sue them civilly. That's the only choice that you have. All right, so in a crime, the state must show beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did two things. Two things. Number one, that he performed a criminal act called the actus reus. All right, for those of you with a Latin background. And, and, bold, and, all caps, bold, and, must have both, while performing the act, had the required intent or specific state of mind, the mens rea, okay? What that means in Latin is guilty mind, okay, guilty mind. Why do we only want to put people in jail that do bad things and had the appropriate intent. Why, why have both? I mean, let's think about this. You're telling me, let, let's say our bad guy killed someone. He killed someone. But, but we can prove, we know that he did not have the required intent or a specific state of mind. Why would we not want to put that person in jail? I mean, he's dangerous. He killed somebody. What? Okay, it was purely an accident. 
Okay, yes, someone is dead as a result of my actions, but I, that's one way. What's another way that might come up? Self-defense. Self-defense, okay. Yes, I killed someone. Normally that would be a crime, but they were trying to kill me, and so I was justified. So we have some defense. Good. What's another one? I'm crazy. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, that was a little tougher because, yeah, you might be crazy, but you're crazy dangerous too. Okay. I mean, we do want. Now, it, it, so what you find in insanity cases <laughs> is that it's, it's not that they lock you up in prison, but they do put you into a mental hospital where you are away from society. All right. At least until a doctor certifies that you are no longer dangerous. Okay. You can spend just as much time institutionalized. Uh, but uh, in, in those cases, the best, best way to go, if you're ever in this situation, Luke, uh, is to claim temporary insanity, and I'm all better now, okay, so you can let me out, and it won't happen again. Uh, so that's what usually happens there. So there's a, there's a difference. There's also a couple more. Mistake, right? Let's say on a rainy day, uh, everybody takes their umbrellas to chapel, right? And uh, you guys know my theory of dating and umbrellas, right? I've given you this. Uh, okay, well, the, the guys who are not dating have the biggest umbrellas known to man, right? Because it's like, come on, ladies, you know, and you got, the, you got it off the back porch, you know, the big, <laughs> the big one. And, and so they have a dozen or so, you know, young ladies underneath each umbrella, and they're walking to chapel. And then the guys who are dating have the world, they get them off the little martini glasses, you know, and they put it right here, and they're just huddled underneath that thing as poss- close as humanly possible uh, within the dating standards, of course. And uh, so there, that's how you can know, all right, who's who. But anyway, you get down to chapel, and uh, you have this massive pile of a 1,000 umbrellas now in the lobby, right? Everybody just kind of throws it down underneath the coats. And you're, you have a black pop-up umbrella, you and everybody else, all right? And so when you come out of chapel, you go to where you think it probably landed as you slid it across underneath the coats, you snag your black pop-up umbrella and walk to class. Well, come to find out that wasn't your black pop-up umbrella. It was someone else's. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Did you commit a criminal act? Yes. <laughs> you, you permanently deprived the true owner of his property when you took it away. But did you have the, the required state of mind to commit a crime? No. Now, here's the key. And this goes way up to philosophy, all right? Philosophy of criminal law. Why do we have a criminal law? What is the purpose of the criminal law? It it goes all the way back to a a foundational belief that is actually Judeo-Christian, okay? And and most people don't want to admit this. (laughs) But it goes all the way back to a foundational belief that there are good people and there are people that should never be around other people, (laughs) okay? That there are are people who are safe and good and do good things, and there are people who are are just bad, and that those need to be separated out. And that the criminal code is our way of figuring out who the bad people are that need to be away from the rest of us so we'll be safe, all right? That's the, the core philosophy of the criminal system. It is not primarily to rehabilitate the bad people. It is primarily to, to help, help figure out who they are <laughs> with the belief that they, they are and were bad before they did these things. All right? And so because we're looking for the bad people, the ones with the guilty mind, the criminal code actually looks at this opposite. You look at it and say, it should be people who do criminal acts. Why do we have to have this intent thing? The law says, no, 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 you're missing the point. These are the ones we're looking for, the guilty mind people. Their bodies we don't worry about. It's their minds, you know. And and so when when the guilty minds, as they inevitably will, end up performing a criminal act, and the two come together, that's how we know who they are. Lock them up. All right, so that's kind of the foundational philosophical reason for the criminal law. That's why we require both. And both. Both must be demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you understand how hard that is? Why? Because what you do in your mind can be difficult to prove, all right? We don't have the brain scanning technology quite perfected yet. And so, you know, some movies, you know, they try to, they try to, 
to get in your mind and, and see and figure out what you're thinking, right? Well, we don't exactly have that nailed yet. So how do we prove intent? What's going on in your mind? Well, by what you do, by what you say. Your actions speak for that. And so that, that, has, to be, that has to be proven. Without the required intent, there can be no conviction. There are exceptions to that, of course. <laughs> All right, let's look at corporate criminal liability. Corporate criminal liability, which is, this is business law after all, uh, when can the business be guilty of a crime? Or, I guess, can a business be guilty of a crime? Well, yes, under certain circumstances. The business itself cannot go to jail, <coughs> obviously, but it can be fined. It can be sent out of business. There can be bad things done to it. And the crime must occur within the scope of employment, meaning that you were commissioned to do this on behalf of the company. Well, we're probably not talking about bank robberies then, are we? We're talking about accounting things, you know, where we're cooking the books. Uh, we're talking about lying to shareholders. We're talking about lying to regulators. Things that are done to benefit the company and as part of your responsibilities on behalf of the company Yes, you will be prosecuted, and the company will be prosecuted and punished. All right? So the corporation can be held criminally liable when they fail to fulfill certain statutes. Some, some of those, for example, are things like you create slot machines. Okay, hopefully none of you ever have that. You know, that would be a, a top five list of rejected capstone project ideas. Okay, <laughs> that'd be a good one. Uh, we're going to make the slot machines, you know. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh man, that was our thing. Uh, well, don't do that. All right, Dr. Fafi will not, not approve that particular concept. <coughs> but if you did, those are subject to all kinds of state regulation to make sure that they're fair, right? You can't have them rigged. And if you, if you built rigged machines, that would be a crime, as committed as part of your, your company. What about the criminal liability of corporate officers? Well, we, we, we hit this a little bit under ethics, but the, under the responsible officer doctrine, you don't even have to know about it to be sent to jail for it. You say, wait a minute, Dr. Davis, you said I had to have intent. How can I have intent to commit a crime I don't know about because you are responsible to know. And so we put a duty on you to know, and the mens rea is you not performing your duty to know and to prevent. Yes? But how can it be possible for to the, the supervisor to know everything that's going on? I mean, isn't that, you don't know the kind of well, that's not what his responsibility is. His responsibility isn't to know everything that's going on. His responsibility is to know certain things, especially, for example, Sarbanes-Oxley. So we talked about the fact that the president has to sign the tax documents, and he's got, it's not good enough to say, what, well, I don't know, the accountants make these, I don't know what they say, I just sign them, you know, they just put them in front of me on the golf course. You can't do that. They make it your responsibility to know that those are accurate, to dig in. So it's kind of like putting the burden on you to go and investigate and do your due diligence before you put your name on something. So that's the responsible officer doctrine. It doesn't come up in a lot of things, but there, it, it, it's usually things that are of such a high level and that have been so publicly violated <laughs> that usually that's where these criminal statutes come from. All right, let's keep going. Types of crime. Well, we've got violent crime. We're going to look at a couple of slides on types of crime, right? you got violent crime. Crimes against people, murders, rape, uh, kidnapping, uh, things like that. Robbery is a violent crime. Robbery is different than burglary and larceny, three different kinds of ways to steal things from people. But robbery is breaking into someone's house or at gunpoint, sticking them up, mugging them is a violent crime. It's a much higher level felony than is larceny a pickpocket or something like that, okay? So robbery is a violent crime. Property crimes is most common, usually involves something involving a theft or a, a destruction of property, like arson. Now, arson could certainly be a violent crime if there was someone in the building, then it's arson, could be murder, okay? 
uh, but certain types, types of property crimes. Burglary uh, is uh, breaking into someone's house at night and stealing from them, but they didn't even know you were there. Okay? Well, that's not a violent crime. It can become a violent crime if they wake up and they tell you to stop and you say no and threaten them. Now it's going to become a worse situation. So don't do that. That's not a good way to pay your school bill, just FYI. All right? See, you learn things every day in business law. Obtaining goods by false pretenses. What does that mean? Well, you find out that a transaction's going down, and you show up and pretend to be someone that you're not in order for someone to deliver the goods to you. Uh, you knew that I was waiting for my new Transformer Prime tablet to arrive, uh, and so you waited on my doorstep when the UPS guy came up. He said, yes, I'm Matt Davis. You signed for it, grabbed it, and went. Okay, well, you obtained goods by false pretenses when you did that. That is a property crime. Forgery, signing your name on a document in order to uh, steal money. All right? Then we could classify another type of crime as white-collar crime. That's a nonviolent crime involving business transactions. I'm not going to go any further for today because I want to tell you a lot about embezzlement in the next class. Okay?